Hey guys, welcome to Bethel Online. My name is Jason, I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad you decided to make us a part of your weekend. No matter who you are, where you come from, we're so glad you're here. Our vision is to be a safe place for real people to encounter the real Jesus and experience real change. Our hope and our prayer is that no matter who you are or what you've been through, you know that you are loved and you are wanted here. We would love to get to know you better and help you connect with all that's going on. You can do this by going to our website at www.bethel.us or by downloading the Bethel app. You can find our app by searching Bethel Putco in your app store. Both online and in the app, you can fill out digital connection card. It only takes a minute and it'll help us know how to serve you better. Another way you can connect today is through giving. Your generosity at Bethel directly impacts God's mission to radically change people's lives in Putnam County and beyond. Through the ministries of Bethel and the many local and regional organizations we support, people are able to see the grace of God and how much He loves them. You can always give on our website at Bethel.us forward slash give or in the Bethel app. Thank you for partnering with us and making a difference. Well, thanks again for tuning in online today. Know that you are wanted and welcome here, and you are loved. I hope you all have a great day. We all have regrets. I mean, people might say, well, live with no regrets, but the reality is I've been a pastor for 20 some years. We all have regrets. I've noticed that young people tend to regret that thing that they did. You know, I wish I hadn't done that. Older people seem to often regret the things they wish they had done, but we all have regrets. And no matter how hard we try to live a big life with no regrets, the reality is without regrets, there's often not learning. But if we want to minimize the amount of regret we live with and live life with fewer regrets, we have to begin to wrestle with where the regrets come from and how we overcome living a life filled with regret. I've heard deep guilt and shame in people about things that they've done. And I've heard deep-seated shame and guilt about the places that a father or a mother missed out in life because of something that they didn't do. Today, I want to talk to you about dreaming big. Regret, I'd like to define regret a little bit here. Regret is the feeling of sorrow over an action or inaction. Most often, regret really comes from settling. Most people I notice toward the end of their life, they, they never say, I wish I had done less, or I wish I had, had tried. They usually say things like, I wish I had done more, tried harder, given it more effort, believed I could do more, worked toward bigger things. Very rarely do I hear people regret big jumps that they took to try to accomplish something. When it comes to the life of our church and your spiritual life, as one walking in faith with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in you, I want to encourage you today that if you want to regret, if you want to avoid regret, that you refuse to settle. So often we chomp off small bites of big things God calls us to. And time moves quickly, and as time moves along, our opportunity to accomplish those things becomes shorter. If I were to go back in my life and talk to 18-year-old me, I would tell myself not to dream smaller dreams, but to dream bigger dreams. To not settle for, for small things, but to trust for big things. The most significant and common thing that I see people really deeply regret is when they settled. And maybe you settled in a relationship and you're like, well, they, they love me and they say they love God, but you really settled for someone who, who really doesn't have much of a relationship with God. Maybe you settled into a habit of a, of a certain career and really you, you always felt you were called to something bigger, but the timeline was going to take a, better, a bigger sacrifice to get there. Maybe at some point in your life, you felt God call you to go do some noble work or some noble task, and you, you kind of hoped someone else would do it, and you always thought it would be cool, but you always thought, well, maybe my giftedness doesn't lend me to be able to do it. Maybe 
The, the reality is that sometimes it's by setting out with big dreams that we find what's actually for us. I remember at one point before Laura and I came to Bethel, I thought I was going to plant a church. I spent 18 months thinking about planting a church. And then we, we got the call to Bethel and, and we came to Bethel and I wondered like, why did I spend all of that time dreaming about planting a church? And, and just now I can look at you and say, Bethel is becoming the very church that we were thinking of when that God had laid on our heart to be a, a church where real people could encounter Jesus and experience real change. But it was in the studying, in the learning, in the growing, in dreaming big that God actually brought us to the place for the big thing he had for us. And even though it didn't look exactly like we thought it would or it didn't go exactly by our plan or, or by the route or road we thought it would, here we are. And so often... We settle for lesser things. I've never regretted a big dream. I, I, I've never regretted dreaming big. The, the dream that I dreamed about may have not come to fruition in the exact way that I envisioned it, but oftentimes it was the dreaming and the acting on the dream that led us to a place of deep meaning and, and helped get things done. And I've seen things that we dreamed about become three times bigger and three times more impactful than what we actually imagined because God was in the dream and we were needing to merely step into the dream. There's a story in 2 Kings, and if you're around Bethel, you're going to find that 2 Kings isn't exactly a place that we're constantly preaching or teaching out of. And it's a story of the history of some of Israel's kings and, and people, and there's a, there are stories in here, but this is a really obscure story of a guy named Joash, and Joash was, was coming to battle with Israel. The thing was that Joash had a, a key important thing with him. He had an aging prophet named Elisha who often spoke as, to him as from God. And he was willing to, to guide through the words of God to guide Joash in his leadership. And this Story finds Joash looking at the charioteers and the chariots of Israel coming down on him, and he's terrified, and he, he refers to Elisha as his father. He says, my father, my father, I see chariots and charioteers of Israel, he cried. Joash was just dreaming of surviving here. He was hoping to survive, and, and we don't see Joash uh, believing good things are coming. He's terrified. And then he begins to get some instruction from Elisha. And Elisha gives him several instructions in the passages between the one we just read and the one we're about to read. And, and he instructs him to, you know, shoot an arrow into, into the ground or to shoot an arrow. And he, he's, he's trying to instruct him about the battle, the impending battle that's coming. And he then tells him, now pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. So the king, Joash, picked up the, the, and struck the ground three times. Now he kind of followed the direction, but I feel like it was kind of looking at, at, at Elisha kind of like, is this right? Is this the right way? And he's just kind of half-heartedly doing what he was called to do wholeheartedly directly from God. So he strikes at three towns, but the, the man of God, Elisha, gets angry with him. And he says, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed, but now you'll be only victorious three times. Now, it sounds great that he's going to be victorious in this battle, and it sounds great that he's going to be victorious a couple more times, but God's call on his life was to be a powerful and victorious king. God's call was that he listen to the words of Elisha and the power that came through them and to trust Elisha wholeheartedly, to dream big about what God was going to do as a part of his life. I believe God wants to do big things in your life. But Elisha seems to go half-heartedly at it here, and it seems to anger the prophet. And what, what am I getting at here? I, what I'm getting at is that if God is with you, who can be against you? If the dream is truly a God-born dream, will God not go with you as you chase it? I want to encourage you to be daring enough to dream big. Erwin McManus says it this way, the greatest tragedy I've ever witnessed over and over again is that we keep underestimating how much God wants to do in us and through us. 
So often we think things like, well, what would God want to do with little old plain me? What would God want to do with with someone who is scatterbrained and can barely keep their weekly plans together, who sometimes forgets what message they're even preaching that week. And, and, and someone, why would God want to, sometimes God loves to use the weak to shame the strong when the weak stand in to a trust that's deep in God. That maybe what we're after is not big dreams, it's big trust. So often our trust or lack of trust in God is what ultimately leaves us to settle. In Ephesians chapter 320, Paul says it like this, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power to work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. What if God's will for your life is bigger than the dream you have for your life? What if the dream sets forward the motion that gets you where you need to go? What if it isn't as much about the dream as the power of God in your life? What if it's about you trusting big more than dreaming big? That you're following the dream isn't a much, as much about making the dream the focus as making putting your trust in motion. See, a life of no regrets requires that you believe it's possible. One of the early stories in scripture, in the book of Exodus, God instructs a man to go lead his people to the promised land. God instructs a man to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And he comes up with all these excuses. You see, even though God had been faithful to him to this point, he had failed to recognize God's trustworthiness in his life. And he began to make up all the reasons why he wasn't enough. But that's exactly the kind of people who God uses. Real people. A life of no regrets requires that you believe it's possible. Believe what's possible. The dream? Or whatever God has set in motion to do great things in your life. In Mark chapter 5 verses 34, there's a story of a woman who had suffered for many years with bleeding and Jesus is in a crowd teaching people and he, he feels literally the power go from him as the woman grabs a hold of his cloak and, and he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. She's hoped to be healed. She's wanted to be healed. I honestly think that she had almost given hope up of being healed. And so often we chase a dream for a while and then we're like, well, it's impossible. But God can do in a minute what we wish God could, what we think God will take a lifetime. God can change in a moment a circumstance that set things in motion that needed to happen. And Jesus says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Her wish, her dream, bigger than she even hoped for, she's restored. God has the capacity and the goodness to do better for us than we can imagine. Be unafraid to wish for big things, to hope for big things, to trust God to do big things, but don't allow smaller things than God's will to pull your attention away from trusting Him. You might find down the road that God was being good long before you saw Him being good. That God was moving on your behalf long before. That God was setting things in motion while you were not even where you're going. There's a story in Mark 9, verse 23. There's a young man who seems possessed. Like, he's totally overcome with this force. And he's possessed by it. And it's throwing him into all sorts of, of issues and causing all sorts of trouble in the community and for him. And when he's asked to heal the man, so someone says, if you can heal him. And Jesus says, what do you mean if I can? You know, ha have you stopped trusting in my power over all things? Anything is possible if a person believes. But here's the thing. So often this passage is misused to teach us that if we pray hard enough for something, we get it. 
I want to ask you, is it better to trust God's will or yours? If your will is the will you're living for in life, is that not too small of a will? God's plan is an eternal plan. Our plan is a temporary plan. What happens when we believe, but God doesn't answer yes? Has God lost his goodness? Has God's character changed? Does God have the power to do what he wills? If it's your will in your life that you're living for, you become God. If, if God has to do it the way that you want him to and carry it out in the fashion that you want, here's the question, is he really your God? That maybe what we're after is big trust, not big dreams. That maybe what we're after is a moment of trusting God when something appears to be dead in us or something doesn't seem to go our way. Because if you remember, Jesus made all of these promises of his resurrection and yet his disciples scattered every which direction when things went bad. Jesus was working on their behalf. He was moving. He was going to be resurrected three days later, but it appeared that there was no hope. And it's often in the moments of no hope that we grow to really no him or in the moments when he reveals himself to us in pain and in struggling that we really experience that he was trustworthy all along what do you mean if i can and by the way pray for your heart go to god with the requests of your heart Going to God is actually a submission to God. It's recognizing He is God and that He's trustworthy. We don't ask for help from one who's not trustworthy. Going to God is an act of faith. But we can go to God with our heart's desire. Because it's when we go to God with our heart's desire that He has the ability to redirect us. And God can answer our prayers, yes. And we all have the story or the story we've heard, or the one where we ask God and God just came through in an incredible, incredible way. And there are times when God comes through with a no, where His will for the good of all of humanity and for the world is to answer no. I would pray over and over again as time as we were getting close to bed, God, help me connect with someone who can help me pull this off. Help me meet the right person who's going to help, who's going to come alongside and we'll plant a church and we're going to do this. And God was taking care of that. It just wasn't the way that I thought. It, it came in a little tiny white church out in the middle of the country, two miles off a paved road at the time, where I met this little group of people who just wanted to serve Jesus. It didn't come by an accidental coffee meeting with somebody who was already maybe an expert or it didn't come from, from this random introduction at some conference where somebody's like, let me tell you about this person. They're unbelievable at planting churches. It, it came by God placing us in a place where people had submitted their heart and, and it was even better, honestly, than what I was thinking. It was better to watch God do a transforming work in those people and in me and actually do it while we were together to watch a transformation happen where rather than baptizing 16 people over 20 years, we watched 16 people be baptized in a Sunday. And God said no numerous times. While I perceived he was saying no, he was actually saying wait. See, God says yes. Sometimes he says no, and sometimes he says wait. And it's so easy to believe it's the will of God when we get what we want, and so hard to understand when it's not. And sometimes the waiting is even the most torturous. The waiting for the goodness of God while you're a prisoner in war. The, the waiting of God while you're waiting on something good to happen. The waiting of job while you grind it out every day, hoping for the better life. The waiting can be so hard but is God capable of it? Yes. Is God's will for you good? Absolutely. Can we have big trust for God? He's historically shown himself to be trustworthy. Number two, a life of no regrets requires that you get crystal clear. That's why I say we need to pray the prayers of our heart. Pray the way you want it to happen. Ask God for it. Pray for God to move in the things that you do toward the direction that you feel that you've, that the dream that God has given you. By all means, do that, because it may be in that, that God begins to teach you what you need for the next season of your life, whether earthly or heavenly. 
A life of no regrets requires that you get crystal clear. Crystal clear about your own motives. Crystal clear about what you desire. And crystal clear about who God is. There's a story in Matthew 20, verse 32, of these two men who, who had been blind. And Jesus is going along, and, and it appears to me in Scripture that wherever Jesus goes, there's just a boatload of need. And Jesus seems to have such patience in dealing with people. But Jesus hears them, and he stops, and he says, what do you want for me to do for you? Jesus didn't tell them to immediately jump to what he wanted for their life. Merely by them coming to him, they were submitting to him being over all things. Jesus asked them, and they said, Lord, we want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes. Instantly they could see. But the real miracle happens here in that when they see, they begin to follow him. Because their earthly eyes would one day no longer see. But following Jesus would lead them to the truth of who God was, to the trustworthiness of who God was. Often we think that what God does for our earthly body is the point. But your earthly body is just your earthly clothes. You're a soul with a body, not a body with a soul. And through Christ, through a relationship with Him, through walking with Him in big trust, you can experience the fullness of what God has for you. And I promise you, it's good. If you were to ask me my biggest regrets in life, it would be that I have this knack when I don't get what I want to stop trusting God. To start to saying things like, well, God's like everybody else, you know, He... He knows how much it matters to me. He knows how important it is. And he's making me wait. Or he seems to be saying no. And then I get angry and I begin to tr question whether or not God's doing anything at all. And is God even trustworthy? If I were to go back, I would tell myself in one 20-year span of my life, hey, buddy, you're going to look back on this entire 20-year span and see how good God was even though you don't now. That many of us, I believe, will one day stand in the presence of God with no regrets because of what he's done for us. But before we get there, we'll have a moment where we say, man, I should have trusted you the whole time. Number three, a life of no regrets requires that we think past ourselves. We often see things from our point of view, and that's why we take it to God. It's for the help to see it through his. What if your no is actually what leads to others saying yes. A life of no regrets requires that we think past ourselves because the scripture teaches us that God so loved the world. He loved us and he loved us individually. But God's plan was to redeem humanity, humanity unto himself. That God's plan is to bring those who are his children into his family. Not by what we deserve, but by his character. And sometimes God will use a no or a wait in our life as the very tool to save the soul of another. And if God's goodness for us is good enough, then it will be good enough. We will be excited about entering into the lives of others the way that he does. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 says, Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. God, if you would use me, if you and your goodness would choose to use me and my tough situation, I think it happens by starting with Jesus. I, I think all of these people coming to Jesus with the hope that they had or the, maybe even the lack of trust that they had, all of these people, all, all of them started by getting to Jesus, by continually being in contact with Jesus. I found myself over the years, things not going my way and kind of stopping praying about things and then later seeing where God had come through about them. Start with Jesus. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give, a give his life as a ransom for many. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane talking to his Father, 
he asked him, he said, you know, if this cup can be taken from me, if I can avoid this suffering, would you? And, and it appears that the answer to this question was no. And there was no one ever more faithful. There was no one ever more trusting than Jesus in the goodness of God. And Jesus had come to serve. And the goodness of his father was the motive for his serving. It was the motive for loving us. And so, my friend, maybe oftentimes we are praying for the things that serve us, when in reality we need to pray for the things that serve Him. Go with the thing on your heart, but allow God to direct you in His path, because it's good. John 12, verse 26 says, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. Bob Goff says it this way, take a look at what Jesus had on his list of ambitions and lift a few onto yours. His list wasn't very long, but it changed the world forever. Will you be daring enough to dream big? And let me go ahead and correct that. Will you be daring enough to trust big before you see how God comes through? I believe you can. Trust big. We'll see you next week. Have a great week, Bethel. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Are you ready to take your next step? We would love to hear from you. You can send an email to hello at Bethel.us. You can send us a message on Facebook, or you can let us know in the Bethel app. And speaking of the Bethel app, take a moment, if you haven't already, to go to your app store and search Bethel Putco to download our app. There's all kinds of great resources in the app. You can listen to messages, you can view the messages from Sunday morning, and you can also fill out a digital connect card. You can do that today and each week to let us know that you're tuning in. You can also find some great information about our Bethel Kids Ministry and our Be The One Student Ministries. Also in the app, you can give. It's one of three ways you can give. With online giving at Bethel.us slash give, in our app, Bethel Putco, or through text. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great day and know that you are loved.